Welcome back to another episode of Debatable with your hosts, Nina and Kyle. I'm Nina. I'm Kyle. For this episode, we interrupt our usual programming to make an announcement. So if you've been following our social media accounts, which maybe you probably should, by the way, you'd know that Kyle and I have a rather big project coming up. But for the purposes of our listeners, we decided to make a formal announcement here as well and give you the details that you need to know about it. Yeah, so we're hosting a tournament. It's called Debatable Open. It's going to be online, an, an Asian parliamentary tournament. It's going to be on January 9 to January 10, 2021. To find out the specifics on how to register and how to participate, observe, and the like, you can visit our Twitter page and our Facebook pages. Uh, we'll also leave links to those pages in the description if you don't know the spelling of like our Twitter handle, for example. We'll just put them in the link. Yeah, so you don't need to worry about that. But for this episode in particular though, Kyle and I wanted to do more than just make the announcement and actually let you in on our thoughts and our uh, efforts and what went into creating and deciding to make this thing happen. So we'll explain why we decided to host a tournament, what you can expect from the tournament, what inspired those ideas, and what else we have planned moving forward. Yeah, because you know, honestly, if you're surprised that we're hosting a tournament. Honestly, we were surprised as well. Yeah, so this was a last-minute decision. Um, Well, not really super-duper last-minute. I- I- admittedly, I've had this on my mind for quite a while because people were always asking, like, what what's next for Debatable? Um, Will you just always be a podcast? And that was a nagging question that I had. But what eventually pushed me to finally... I create a tournament after uh, almost two years of podcasting at this point was the tournament that I went to like earlier this month, which was uh, Padayon. And for that tournament, there were a lot of novices there and I had a lot of fun and I was exposed to so many newbies and like it, it just made my heart swell. And seeing that just um, sort of lit a flame in me again towards novice education and I realized it's been a while since there has been a tournament or new mechanics in the sport uh, like specifically for novices. Um, I guess the last reason would be besides the hangover of the tournament and the spark of novice education it would be the fact that online tournaments seemed like a lot easier. I mean obviously there are difficulties as well but a lot of the barriers that prevented me from ever imagining a tournament happening sort of fell apart because like everything going online meant that planning things would also have to be online and that would that was objectively easier for me to imagine well in my case i was just the idea guy i, I was like mm. after padayon i was talking with you and i was like wouldn't it be cool if we had a tournament like this, where, like, just to shake things up, what if it didn't have an edge core? What if we, we put the focus on having post-debate analysis, those kinds of things. So I, I fell in love with the idea. So despite me being very busy, um, I got into the groove of it, and then I was like, yeah, yeah, let's do it, let's do it. Because, um, like, I knew that there would be a lot of challenges to organizing something like this, because... A lot of the features have just never been done before, or they have yeah. been done before in different situations, but I don't feel like there was ever a, a, an attempt to like synthesize all of these things. Because I'm pretty sure that like having PDAs, um, giving comments on judging, all of those things already exist in different places, but I didn't see like a concerted effort to bring all of those pieces together. And I thought that this could be like an interesting puzzle to solve or like an interesting experiment as well. And then with that, everyone ended up going to work. So we were having that conversation, not just amongst ourselves, um, but in front of like basically the the chat box for Padayon and people who were part of that tournament. So the other members of the UP Debate Society. Um, and they were also interested in the idea. And in that one evening, an org gom was formed. So tournament directors would be Kyle and I. We also have deputy tournament directors. So hello to Ferdin Sanchez and Jill Sandigan. We have communication directors, um, Bea Legaspi and CJ Carlos. 
We have our tech directors, which are Car- Carlo Pastor and Tim Gamez. We have our pub directors. So if you liked our publicity materials and you like our posters and our other like cutesy paraphernalia, then you can thank Jill Icardo for those things, for um, brightening up your timeline. We have marketing and finance director, um, Nicole Pensino, and we have our tab directors, Paul Bodang and Thea Madriliejo, the tab goddess herself. So all of those people we're very grateful for because this tournament was made in a span of a week, basically, and they've been just very helpful in helping Kyle and I actualize this dream of ours. Yeah, most of those people we got on board in like the first, like the first two hours, you already... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> we already got them on board because basically what happened was I was talking to Nina about the idea and then Nina was like, oh, this is a great idea. This is a great idea. Um, so I brought it up to to this group chat and I was like, wouldn't it be great, guys, if we had a tournament like this, like this? And everyone really got into it. And I was like, hmm, would you guys be interested in helping us organize one if ever? And then... <laughs> I wasn't expecting like people to say yes, but surprisingly, people did say yes. They were G to help organize, um, and I think like Ferdin was saying, "Gosh, I really miss organizing tournaments." And to me, I was like, "Really? That's the kind of thing that you miss?" But okay, like if we didn't really have ascendancy because we were the ones who were thinking of making a tournament from scratch in the first place. Yeah, yeah. So basically, like. The, for the first three hours, most of the org com was already complete. And now for the next week, we were just like conceptualizing um, our strategies, like the, the finance plans for the tournament. Oh god, um, I hate that. Yeah. Remember like we had like spreadsheets um, for Ooh. like hypotheticals, Ooh. what our goals were as, as a tournament, those kinds of things. Yeah. Um, and then by by the end of the week the idea sort of took hold already. Like, most of it was finished. We were just tweaking, like, wordings of possible pubs, those kinds of things na lang. So, what can you expect from this tournament? Like, what did we conceptualize in that week of chatting, Kyle? Well, the first thing that I... The, the first thing that we really did agree on was having no edge core because... You know, when, when you enter into tournaments and then there's a particular set of chief adjudicators or deputy chief adjudicators, you kind of get the sense that, oh, this member of the Edge Corps specializes in this um, topic and this other Edge Corps member specializes in some other topic. So if if I were in Edge Corps, people would go like, oh, it's probably going to be philosophy. It's probably going to be law or econ or religion. And for the most part, they're probably going to be right. So, uh, because like, as a person who's really interested in those topics, I have a lot to say about those topics. So I was thinking, what if instead of having like a dedicated edge core, what if we get people to come in and contribute motions, contribute like their insights onto things that they're most passionate about um, and discuss those things. And after that, like the next step was okay, since we're bringing them along for their expertise, the next step should probably be let them lecture or let them teach other people about why they love this topic or like what the different angles would be if they were going to debate these topics. So that that's the idea for the no edge core part and the post-debate analysis part. And it was also because we both liked the idea of also utilizing the platform we already had and the fact that a lot of post-debate analyses are very very limited to the tournament proper. There are no real recordings of post-debate analyses found online. So when you see a motion, you just have the rounds to refer to. And then maybe if you're lucky, you have someone who has case built the round and has uploaded their version of it. But you barely hear Agecore actually talking about the motions they've created and what arguments they expect people to run for that. So we figured it would be a good opportunity to make use of our platform for further education as well as the people who 
would be better off talking about topics that Kyle and I might not be super duper familiar with. Also because, I, I guess admittedly, edge scoring is very tiring. A lot of times, people are too busy to commit a full weekend to being edge core. So asking them to make motions would be a lot more manageable for them, especially the older individuals who have, like, quote-unquote, retired from debate, right? Yeah, and also, okay, so the reason why the post-debate analysis will just be pre-recorded and then it will be, like, aired first and foremost during the tournament is because the the fact that it's pre-recorded lowers the barrier to, to entry. So yeah. it's much easier for like m- really busy motion contributors to be G for this kind of thing if they could just... If it was super flexible um, to their schedule. So that's part of why we did what we did. And yeah, th- there will be... like We're going to be releasing the interview twice. The first time we're going to be releasing it will be during the tournament itself. Um, because in as much as you want to give that opportunity to everyone, even if they're not in the tournament, our first and foremost um, responsibility and priority we recognize should be the people in the tournament itself. Mm. And then the second time we're going to release it, we're going to be releasing it, will be after the tournament. And those will be like our episodes na. Yeah. So besides that, we also figured out a way to help the judge pool as well. Because we recognize the post-debate analyses would be really helpful for debaters, but we also didn't want to leave judges behind. So we figured we would have a live judge feedback system. So, of course, um, judges will still not be able to see their scores, but we do want them to be able to see the written feedback debaters have left for them. And the logic here, uh, at least for me, is that it would be the equivalent of getting personal comments. Because... We have learned as debaters how to accept personal comments and as judges how to give personal comments without hinting at what the score is going to be anyway. So I don't see why we can't do the same thing for judges. And that's the kind of thing I wanted to normalize uh, moving forward. Yeah, and there's also this idea where um, so- someone asked us, like, what if people are too harsh um, to their judges and their feedbacks? Um and we said that actually maybe a way for people to be less harsh and more critical, you know, like more objective would be through the use of um, feedback. So it, it's more like personal comments in, in that sense. Like, yes, your personal comments from your judge might be harsh or they might not be. You know, but there, there's already an incentive to be as objective as possible because the mm. goal of the personal comment is to help the debater improve and grow. Um, and that's the same like attitude that debaters should be taking when they're writing their feedback. Because it, I think right now, the way that we approach feedback is we're not really trying to talk to the judge. We're trying to talk to Adjcore. So, for example, like if, if you write a complaint, if you give your judge a one, it's going to be a lot of... It's going to be like an essay trying to tell Adjcore that this judge wasn't that good um, in, in that oral adjudication. Can I just so, say, though, I don't I yeah. don't understand why people do that. Because... Even if they write it in Taber, they still have to approach Adjcore anyway. So I figured, like, by now, people should realize that Adjcore doesn't actually read all the feedback that they receive on Taber because it's going to take them forever to go through that in the first place. So I'm, I'm like, you're right that people do write feedback because they feel like they're talking to Adjcore. But I don't think that was ever the intention of Taber when that feature was created. Or was it? Not sure. Yeah, I don't think it was ever the intention to like just the feedbacks being used to talk to Adjcore. But like, I think the the way the reason why this practice came about is because whenever you like declare a soft conflict with a one, for example, um, in order for that to make sense, Adjcore is typically like go to the debater and then ask why, why did you do this? Why did you do this? So. 
the the practice matured such that feedback was like the preliminary step before the adjcore interview asking why a one mm. was given so i think we have to like change that because you you're basically like it's not supposed to be like a complaint form it's supposed to be like helping the judge improve and i think the practice that we have right now sort of forgot that So we want to either make people remember what the feedback forms are supposed to be about or let's at least change the attitude or start changing the attitude towards um, giving comments, more constructive comments towards a judge. Because mm-hmm. we expect the same from our judges. Why can't we expect, as judges, the same from debaters, right? Yeah, the the other thing people would say, though, uh, at least what we got as comments would be, Well, they can still see the feedback after anyway. Why did we have to make it live? And for me, the simple answer would be because at the end of the tournament, it's too late. Um, We'd want them to constantly improve as the tournament goes on the same way debaters get to improve as the tournament goes on. So I felt it was only fair if both got an equal shot of like constantly improving and the opportunities to do so. Yeah, and that's all. <laughs> yeah, and then obviously we have... Like the next step would be let's have novice breaks, mm. let's have judge subsidies, those kinds of things. So I think what's really interesting here is we started from this weird idea of having no edge core, and then I think from that we said, oh, this would be a good opportunity to focus on education, and then everything came after that. After we thought about having motion contributors. Once we realized it would be good for education purposes, that's when we thought about um, post-debate analysis. And then after that, we said, hmm, but what would the judges get in terms of education? And that's where we put the live judge feedback system. Um, so it's, I like it because we approached it the same way we would approach prep. Like, <laughs> we, have right, like a, right. we have like a central goal or like, I, I don't know, what do you call that? Like a stance. Um, a burden? Not not really. No, not a burden. Um, An but so it's goal? like your 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 central stance. In, in mm-hmm. this case, it's like education, mm. and then all the pros and all of the arguments um, are trying to get to that central goal. That that's basically how we prep. It's just like it doesn't take us five days to do that. Yeah, But, we just prepped yeah. an entire tournament. It's just, just a longer version. And we even had preemptions, Kyle. We even yeah, preempted we did have preemptions as well. Like, like a lot of the concerns people had about like the tournament. Yeah, so anyway, hopefully that gave all of you an idea of what to expect for next year. We also hope that we've convinced some of you to sign up and register for the tournament if you haven't yet. Um, we also wish that if you're from another circuit listening to this or another institution... That this episode also gave you ideas on how you can change up online debating or debating in general to be much more accommodating and enriching than it already is. Yeah, so that's it for this episode of Debatable. We're returning to our regular programming again soon, so don't worry. Episodes won't stop altogether just because of this tournament. So we'll see you again in the next episode. Bye-bye! Bye!